please welcome to the stage, Deanne Navelli! So hooray, that's how I feel. I feel very hooray today. Um, thank you very much for coming out to this recording. Um, my name is Pierre Novelli. If you've not seen me before, just clear that up straight away. Do a bit of admin up top. Uh, Pierre, French, Novelli, Italian. Uh, I have a French-Italian name because I am South African. So, <laughs> yes. From, uh, from Johannesburg, if you know South Africa at all. Um, I'm from the crime one. <laughs> Easiest way to explain it. I'm not from the holiday one, or the surfing one, or the safari one. I'm from the crime one, where the crime is. I'm, I'm from the part of South Africa where you're the most likely to bump into Louis Theroux. And it's, it's never good to see him nosing around. Like, if you move to a new neighborhood and on day one you look out of your living room window and Louis out there filming, you fucking you shit yourself, wouldn't you? You go, Jesus, what did the estate agent forget to mention about my neighbors, you know? You think, fingers crossed, Mormons or swingers? Those are the only nice people he chats to, I think. And either way, you're just dealing with a case of very friendly neighbors, right? That's fine few leaflets through the door kind of thing. That's okay. I heard a story once. Well, actually, I've heard it a few times, so I don't know if it's like a popular urban myth or if it's a real phenomenon, but I've heard this quite a few times, three or four. When an old folks' home gets a cat, right, like a pet cat for the whole old folks' home, um, apparently there's this thing that can happen where the cat will start to sleep on the bed of the next resident to depart. <laughs> and so the cat sort of can somehow sense who's next to, to go and will select that bed to sleep on, uh, like a sort of omen of doom. Um, and that's Louis Theroux, isn't it? <laughs> but, but for where you live. That's how I see him. Um, I did not grow up in Johannesburg. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I grew up. Um, <laughs> There were other reasons, food and shelter and everything else was a big part of it, but it's statistically just it helps to not be there. Um, just overall, we moved to the Isle of Man when I was quite young, because why not? Why not add another layer to this diverse and yet completely white cake? Why not? Oh, if you've seen me before, by the way, obviously you'll already have known all that bio stuff, but you'll be thinking, well, why aren't you dressed like you normally are? When I gig, I subscribe normally to the Steve Martin School of Entertainment, which holds that the performer should be the best dressed person in the room. And normally I wear black uh, leather shoes, black suit trousers, a crisp white shirt, and a red velvet jacket. And the reason I'm not wearing any of those things now is I have become too fat. So. <laughs> Too fat for the nice things. None for you, too fat. It's the trousers that are the problem, to be honest. The, the, the shirt I can just about stretch over my hairy belly, but the trousers are, are bad. And they fit so badly that I was trying them on in my flat, in my bedroom, on my own. They wedged at like the knee. That's how badly they fit. And out loud on my own, I went, what? <laughs> it, was, it was bad. It was bad. And I, I thought, I'm going to have to get some emergency trousers. I've got shows. And so I went uh, on to Marks and Spencer's online. Treat yourself. Rishi Sunak's paying. <laughs> Why not treat myself if Rishi's picking up the bill? While I was ordering my emergency trousers, I did think to myself, you know what, Pierre? Maybe it's time to accept that these aren't your emergency trousers. <laughs> these are just your new trousers. <laughs> and then they arrived, and they were too small. So, <laughs> mistakes have been made. Made and repeated. Mm. Some of you might be thinking, you don't look like 
like big, like madly big or anything. Like I wouldn't think, you know, necessarily. I'm so heavy. <laughs> I'm a heavy boy. I'm dense like lead, like a dying star. I'm so. Uh, I weigh like two stone, 12 kilos more than most rugby internationals. <laughs> and with them, it's strength, isn't it? Whereas with me, it's egg fried rice, I think, is the way. <laughs> I'm so heavy. And the reason that I don't necessarily look as extreme as that is because when I get fatter, when I gain weight, I gain weight evenly over my whole body at once. And which I know is not how you people do it. <laughs> you all seem to get fat in one place at a time, and you have my sympathies because you get fat, chin, then belly, then left bum cheek, then right bum cheek, whatever it is. <laughs> it's not how I operate. When I get fat, it's evenly all over. Imagine someone slowly just siphoning butter into a wetsuit. <laughs> just to sort of... Almost imperceptible increasing girth over time, over the whole form, till your shoes are tight. I got this way because I followed some advice, and it was very, very bad advice. And it's advice that mostly women get. But I thought, what's good for the goose, you know? I thought, I'll give this a go. It's lady <laughs> advice, but I'll try it out for me. And the advice is, listen to your body. <laughs> Which you must never, ever do. Your body is your second worst enemy after your mind. Your mind and your body want only what is worst for you in this world and they are not to be trusted. And it's, it's all very well, the kind of women who give out this advice, listen to your body, you see that on Instagram. It's a lady scratching the back of her head with her big toe. <laughs> in front of a sunset somewhere. And then in cursive it says, listen to your body. And you think, very well for you. When you listen to your body, it says things like, oh, salad is pudding. <laughs> when I listen to my body, it says, why aren't you eating KFC? And I don't have a repast. <laughs> it's a good point. I go say, fair enough, and I go and I eat some. Because I don't have a counter argument to that. I don't have a good reason. Also, when it speaks to me, it's like the voice from the one ring, like Lord of the Rings. Like, oh, Scotty, he's got a one. <laughs> eat some chicken. <laughs> go ahead. Is that normal? <laughs> I hope so. Listen to your body, it's terrible advice. You wouldn't say that to a heroin addict, would you? What does your body want? Heroin, to be honest. I'm a heroin addict. Stupid fucking advice. Terrible advice. Trouble is, I use food as a reward. That's what I do. I'm an emotional eater and I reward myself with food. So I say to myself, for example, well, I've had a very good day. You know, I've got a lot done. I sent that email. <laughs> Practically Bill Gates. I should reward myself with some sort of enormous takeaway meal. Or, um, it's been a pretty bad day. It's been a tough day. But I've survived. And why not celebrate that fact with some sort of enormous takeaway meal? Or, um, if you had a normal day. Just a normal day, boring day. Not a lot's really happened. Why not spice things up? <laughs> With some sort of enormous takeaway meal. Only those three types of day, though. Um, one must have rules. You've got to have rules in this life. Um, it's KFC, by the way, that's done a lot of this damage. Um, when I was a young heavy boy, uh, it was pizza. Pizza was my thing. And now it's become fried chicken of all stripes, but particularly KFC. The Colonel's a military man and he has me surrounded. <laughs> I can't compete with that training. I assume he was in Nam. The Colonel's a master tactician and he knows exactly how to get me. The genius of the Colonel, and it is genius, is uh, in his marketing, his strategy in his marketing. Um, because uh, I, what I get from KFC when I go there is a mighty bucket for one. Which is a repulsive phrase, but... That's the Colonel's power. 
He's so good, he can make this guy awful phrases sound appetizing, like boneless banquet. You can get one of those. <laughs> Horrible medieval banquet where no one's got any bones. <laughs> but the colonel makes it work. Mighty bucket for one. The genius lies in the word mighty. Because the colonel, in his wisdom, knows that not even someone as emotionally dependent on his chicken as me is willing to walk into a KFC on my own, probably late at night, walk up to the cashier. When the cashier says, how can I help you, sir? Even I, then, in that moment, I'm not willing to say, bucket for one, please. <laughs> Bucket for one. <laughs> Do you mean family bucket, sir? So you can share the lovely chicken with your family. I have no family. <laughs> bucket for one. We have lots of box meals and sandwiches you could enjoy. No. I still want enough chicken to necessitate a bucket. <laughs> but not so much that only two or more people could handle it. <laughs> I want it to be in a bucket because I'm a hog. <laughs> a lonely hog. And I'd like to eat like one. <laughs> bucket for one, please. <laughs> You'd kill yourself, wouldn't you, the next day? Chuck the word mighty in there. Oh, now you're in the Avengers, aren't you? You're a superhero now. Oh, a mighty bucket. Oh, I'm feeling quite mighty myself. My power is I can eat chicken till I feel like I have the flu. Till I have a sweat in my lower back. Mightier with every bite. All I want, if I listen to my body, all I want is to eat chicken three times a day and die at 47. That's what I want. <laughs> I won't do it, if only to save the NHS the hassle. <laughs> but it's what I want. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't what I'm being told to do. <laughs> All the whispering. It's absolutely what I'm being told there, or constantly. Eat it, eat it. So, that's what I want. I won't do it, but it's what I want. What I want is to eat chicken three times a day, every day, till I die at 47, and then when, when I get cremated, right, I want my corpse to be so suffused with chicken grease that when they cremate me, they do it for free. <laughs> I want the crematorium staff to come out to meet my family <laughs> and say, We've never seen a guy go up like that. He had a blue flame. We used him to do the next guy. We owe you money now, I think. We, we've just done the first green cremation, technically. That's what I want. I got so heavy, I, 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 I killed a chair with my ass. I killed a chair, I murdered it, it died. I killed it. It turns out chairs have a maximum weight. I didn't know that. It's in the manual. It's in, this, chairs come with small print, it turns out. You think something relatively simple like a chair would not have a sort of trap element. Also, I don't read the manual when I buy a chair. <laughs> Not to sound arrogant. <laughs> but when it comes to sitting in chairs, I do rather feel like I've been to the University of Life. <laughs> and I was wrong, it was hubris. Because there is a little warning in there that says, beware. If you weigh 100 kilograms or more, and I weigh a lot more than that. <laughs> dense boy. If you weigh 100 kilograms or more, beware. The IKEA Herkel Durkel chair, or whatever it is, is not equipped for someone of your sheer density, and you're taking your life into your own hands. And that's why it died. It died. I was on quite an important Zoom call, to be honest, actually. And while I was on this Zoom call, the chair was in the elevated position, right? Like that, with a little paddle there. 
and it died under me. It died under me like an elderly lover. <laughs> and because the shaft of the chair is full of air, right? That's what elevates the chair, and you pull the paddle, and it goes, tss, and you can adjust it. It meant that the, the air all escaped at once because it collapsed. And that meant that there was like an actual death gasp. <laughs> <sighs> as I like, as my head fell out of sight. And everyone on the Zoom call was like, Pierre, have you been? Have you shut your laptop? My chair was dead and I had to get a new chair and this was in lockdown, so I had to just get a chair for big fuckers. <laughs> but I don't know where to get that from in even normal times. So I was just like, well, it's gonna have to be Amazon, you know? But what do you search to find a chair for big fuckers? You have to type in the keywords to Amazon. You go on Amazon, you go, uh, Heavy chair, KFC, regret, search. And this chair comes up and I bought it. It's f this thing. Oh, I bought it. This thing, first of all, there's not an Allen key to be found. All drill. <laughs> this thing's got fucking rivets. It's the sturdiest thing I own. It's like a tank. It's like all metal parts. It's astonishing. Two opera singers could fuck on this chair. Nothing would happen. <laughs> it's just like... It wouldn't even move. It's incredible. I think it's the most valuable thing I own now. A giant metal chair. Oh, it's, been a, it's been a very uh, boring apocalypse, to be honest with you. It's been very dull. Um, I thought that I would do quite well in an apocalypse. Like I think a lot of men do. But the reason I thought I'd be all right is I thought, well, I like camping, I can read maps, I can do orienteering, you know, I can do first aid, I'm familiar with most firearms, if only from childhood. Uh, <laughs> you never forget. You never forget. And so I thought, the apocalypse, I, I'm not, you know, massively looking forward to it, but I reckon I could do all right. What I'm saying is, I thought that it would be an outdoors apocalypse. <laughs> I really would never have thought that you can have an entirely indoor apocalypse. <laughs> what, what I wanted in my head was me standing on the roof of an abandoned petrol station, firing a shotgun into the air to scatter a group of wasteland raiders. <laughs> Mad Max, you know, not fucking happy birthday to you. <laughs> it was pathetic. You can't get any sympathy for that, can you? I wanted it to be much worse, and I wanted that for all of us. I mean that, and I mean it in a nice way. I thought it could have been our World War II. It could have been our Blitz. It could have been bad enough that it would have given us something to dangle over the heads of our children and grandchildren for the next seven generations. It would have left a stain on politics for a hundred years, just like World War II has in the Blitz. Because in the UK, if you were even nearly involved in World War II, you are just untouchable. You have like infinite respect and credit, right? And that could have been us. Look at what the World War II generation got because they could all stand up and say, well, we did our part, time to cough up. All that free housing, all that free housing. The NHS even existing. 40 to 50 years of constant prosperity. Free uni, you name it. Blank check for the World War II guys. That could have been us, but it wasn't bad enough. It wasn't bad enough. It was bad, but it wasn't that bad. It wasn't World War II bad, and that's what I wanted. And I'm annoyed because my cousins in South Africa, their lockdown, it was. Now they've fucking got that over me. Every Christmas, they're going to be given it this. Because in South Africa, if you don't know, a lockdown was enforced by the army. There were tanks on traffic intersections. The army went around fucking people up and forcibly shutting down shops that shouldn't have been open. They banned all alcohol and tobacco sales for a total of six months over four different periods. Yeah. <laughs> Pierre, didn't prohibition naturally lead to an explosion in organized crime? Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't there already quite a big organized crime problem? Yeah. Didn't that mean that the organized crime and the police and the army formed a kind of triangle? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. 
then they, they've got that now, so I, what am I going to say to them? Yeah, well, things might have been bad in South Africa, but have some sympathy for me, I got fat. <laughs> A little bit of respect wouldn't go amiss. <laughs> Can't say that to someone from Africa. It's hard having too much food. It doesn't really scan as a problem. 50 years from now, 40 years from now, it's Christmas time. Got all the grandkids running around. And they say, oh, Grandpapa, oh, you were in the great lockdown. Oh, what was it like? Please tell us. We're doing a big project at school. Please, well, you were there. What was it like? And I'll say, no, 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 I don't. No, please. And I'll go, oh, very well. Gather around my enormous chair. Okay. Still going strong after all these years. <laughs> a few patches of rust where I've knocked over dip or something, but... <laughs> Still going strong. Gather around the chair, they all gather around and they say, what was it like? And I go, oh, oh, it was hard. I wouldn't wish it on any of you, no. It was tough. You see, normally, children, in those days, we had things called offices, and we had to spend the entire day trapped in them. And in order to get there to be trapped for the whole day, we had to do a thing called a commute, where we were trapped in a train, bus, or car. Now, those things formed vital barriers between us and the endless mountains of delicious food. <laughs> but without those vital barriers in place, there was no reason not to just eat the delicious food constantly all day. <laughs> oh, it was difficult. And they say, gosh, that must have been tough, Grandpapa. All that cooking. No, there was no cooking. <laughs> Not after the first month. <laughs> no, we would have delicious food from restaurants, ch children. That's what we would eat. Still, though, Grandpapa, it must have been dangerous to to walk to a local restaurant to pick up the food and thus risk the virus. No, no, it was all takeaway, no. No, it was takeaway. Uh, what would happen is a little man on a bicycle from a country that I can't find on a map would bicycle it to my mouth. Right in here. Still, Grandpapa, it must have been tough to answer the door and look that man in the eye knowing what you've made him risk. No, contact-free delivery, no. I... It was actually sort of illegal for me to look him in the eye. By the time I opened the door, he'd better be gone, actually. And the delicious food in a neat pile on the mat, like an elf did it. And we had to get drunk in the living room, where it was cheaper. I wouldn't wish it on any of you, no. But that can't have been it, Grandpa. There must have been a point where the government said that we need every man, woman, and child to play their part, to step up and help the great effort against this horrible enemy. They must have put out some sort of call or national service. Oh, yes. The government blew the bugle and we answered. Oh, yes, we played our role. The government decided that none of us were nearly fat or drunk enough. So they offered to pay for half. <laughs> the actual government <laughs> offered to pay for half of all the delicious food <laughs> during the most glorious three summer months of our lives. I saw things I can't remove from my mind. Things I hope you children never see. Four starters a person. People ordering cream spinach just as a laugh. <laughs> you wouldn't have lasted a minute. All those months of lockdown, and I never broke. I never broke. I held firm. I never once even tried to make a vegan meal. Never even tried. <laughs> and I could have. I have lentils, not to boast. <laughs> Didn't do it once, never broke. Constant stream of meat. <laughs> never broke, never broke. I, I have a lot of vegan friends. It's a big thing in comedy. A lot of comedians are vegan. Um, and I admire it. I admire the hell out of it because it seems incredibly difficult. And I just don't have that 
strength. I don't have that discipline. I just, <laughs> I talk to them and I say, well, what did you have for breakfast? You know, your daily life. And they go, well, I had an omelet. And I'll be like, well, no, you didn't. <laughs> Those have eggs in, don't they? What did you really have? And they say, well, I had a vegan omelet. And they go, yeah, but what's it made from? Ghosts? What is it? Come on. <laughs> If it's not made from egg, there's not much left of an omelet, is there? It's just some loose peppers. And they go, no, well, okay, so what you've got to do if you want to make a kind of vegan egg white substitute, you've got to get like a tin of chickpeas and you need to open it and you've got to drain the water from the chickpeas and separate it out. And already I've quit, I've quit. I've quit veganism and I've bought an egg. I've just gone out and I've bought an egg. And I, I buy nice eggs. I'm not a dick about it. I buy the nice eggs where the chickens run around, they go to uni, whatever. <laughs> I get the nice ones. And I don't have to. I, I could live high on the hog with the kind of egg access I have. 30 eggs in a massive catering tray for two pounds 10. Yeah, those are not happy eggs. Those are some sad eggs. The thing that made those eggs is no longer visibly a bird, is it? <laughs> it's just two drumsticks and an anus, just woo! <laughs> just firing them out. Like some kind of awful reverse Pac-Man. I'm never gonna, I, well, I don't think we're ever gonna stop eating chicken. They say the, the future's vegan and I guess we could all cut out beef and, and lamb and whatever, but chicken is just, it's too good. It's too good. And I don't mean that just in terms of taste, I mean as efficiency as a food source. It's incredibly efficient. Like if you were a farmer and you'd never heard of a chicken and I explained one to you, you'd think I was fucking lying. <laughs> it's that good, you'd be like, this guy cannot be a real animal. Like, if you'd never heard of one, and let's say, like, I got sent round by, like, the Department for Agriculture, and I was like, you should really consider raising chickens. You go, what's a chicken? I go, well, it's a football <laughs> made of meat. <laughs> it's a meat football, and it lives in the garden. <laughs> They'd be like, right, it's a meat football, it lives in the garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there's quite... Big thing that I forgot to mention. Once a day, the meat football will shit out bonus food. <laughs> Every day for free. And the bonus food it shits out is one of the best foods in the world. On its own, it's delicious, salt and pepper. Mix it with flour, have a birthday cake, whatever you want. It's very flexible. Glaze a bun, it doesn't matter. It's high in protein, it's high in good cholesterol, it's high in vitamin B12, it's practically a superfood. And the farmer would be like, what, it comes out and I just scrape it off the farmyard floor? No, it comes in a packet. <laughs> yeah. it just arrives in a packet. You'd be like, there's no fucking way. You'd be looking for the catch. That's what I would be doing if I was that farmer. I'd be like, there's always a catch. There's no such thing as a free lunch. What's the catch here? This thing's laying eggs. What is it, like a lizard, a bird? No, it's a bird. Well, there you go. It's just gonna fly away. <laughs> no, I don't think that'll be a problem. What does it just not have wings? No, it has wings, but um, they're not so much an escape mechanism as a, as a starter. <laughs> That's how fucked this animal is. We've bred it for food to the point where its main anti-predation device is just a, another reason to eat it. <laughs> it's incredible. It used to be like, there's gotta be a catch. With cows and pigs, it's the amount you have to feed them to get them up to weight, right? That's the amount, that's the, that's the real expense with cows and pigs. So the farmer would be like, well, what do these things eat? These miracle animals, chickens, what do these things eat? Uh, the floor? <laughs> they seem to eat the floor. Got any floor on your farm? <laughs> Hope so. Anyone do any lockdown dating? Room full of liars, that's okay. That's fine. No one went on a horrible date in a park. Like some virginal Edwardian. <laughs> Come, we will uh, take a turn about the rose garden. Discuss your father's affairs. 
I went on a few park dates in lockdown. It was fun. It was like trying to have sex with a Cold War spy. <laughs> we'll meet in the park, but we must sit on opposite ends of the bench. <laughs> if anyone asks, we live together. <laughs> and there were some nice, like, sort of 1984 dystopian elements to it as well, because it was all illegal. You could think to yourself, yes, they're attractive, but are they attractive enough to risk the disease? <laughs> What if they have the disease and my telephone can sense it? <laughs> They'll lock me away. It's great, a horrible futuristic dystopian movie we all lived in there. I, uh, I managed to snag, uh, if you remember that window where Rishi Sunak tried to get us all to go get COVID. Um, it does in hindsight look a lot like a murder attempt. Yes, um, if they're all fat, it'll be even harder for them to recover. Yes, food, 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 food. Another 10% off the meal if you cough in each other's mouths. Go, 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 go. I managed to snag myself a girlfriend in the, in the, the Rishi window. Um, and it was, I mean, I, uh, and thank God, I mean, it was a real win for me because at the time, my, you know, my job was illegal and I was at my very fattest, so. I was a literally like, overweight, unemployed clown. <laughs> so she's really bought Bitcoin at the dip, you know. <laughs> I hope. I hope that's not another dip like that. See if it pays off. No, uh, I, and I, I, I managed to get my girlfriend pre-cat. I'm allergic to cats, that's why that matters, by the way. I turned, I turned 30 in lockdown one, and I was worried about dating in my 30s, because I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> once, once you switch the age range to 30 plus on the apps, every second person's got a picture of their fucking cat. And the caption is like, don't swipe yes if you don't get along with my son. <laughs> my girlfriend is a real person, by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm, I know, thank you. I'm pleased too. <laughs> what I mean by that is she has a real job in the real world. So that's what I, anyone who doesn't work in comedy, I call a real person because people who work in comedy are um, mentally ill babies. So <laughs> good luck to her. Good luck to her. That's what I say. Um, so she's a real person, like I imagine many of you are, which means she has a job that has things like, you know, a salary and consequences. So. <laughs> Her friends are real people too, and when we all hang out, they talk about real people stuff from their jobs, and I have no idea what's happening, because I've done this for years, and I'm so divorced from, like, a job in an office, that, like, I don't even know the nouns they're using. It's like being four. <laughs> they're talking about, like, well, you know, we've got to keep the kind of B2B tech synergy requirements front of mind for the upcoming <laughs> webinar of the... It's all like LinkedIn stuff, I have no idea what's happening. But I'm like sort of sat there at the, the dinner table and they're all talking like that. I have nothing to contribute. So it's like they've let a four-year-old sit at the grown-up's table. <laughs> and I've just sat there like, oh, chicken's interesting, isn't it? If you think about it. <laughs> the eggs are free. They're so... <laughs> so I have nothing to contribute. And I, I had a revelation where I was sat there and I was thinking like, wow, I really am a giant clown. Um, and I had a revelation where I realized if this was a movie, right, if this scene I'm in right now was like in a film, my character would be played by Jack Black. <laughs> That's me now. I'm the guy who's like, oh, can I pay my rent in guitar solos? I'm that guy now. And I'm going to have to save a community centre with some misfit teens. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to it. That's what you have to do. All those movies where, like, the kind of fun, waster adult finds his responsible self through helping a bunch of misfit teens, like, save the community centre or the music programme or whatever's being threatened by evil principle or whatever. <laughs> the thing I don't like about those films, and there are loads of them, is so they'll be like, oh, no. Evil guy's gonna shut down good thing for kids. And if good things for kids get shut down, oh, we'll have nothing. And it's gonna cost $10,000 to save it, right? And then they see a poster that says Battle of the Bands, 
grand prize, $10,000. And they go, yeah, and they win it, and they get $10,000. And the entire time that's happening, I'm sat there going, per annum. <laughs> Your $10,000 is at best a sticking plaster, Mr. Black. <laughs> for the desultory finances of this music center. You better be able to win every year. I'm gonna have to get the auditors in here. KPMG, I don't know. <laughs> have a look at what's happened to these books of yours. Do I smell marijuana, Mr. Black? <laughs> Realism, that's what I demand in my art. Endless, suffocating realism. <laughs> I admire realism. I like it. I think it's an impressive thing to be able to pull off. Halloween, realistic costumes, they're the best. They have the most respect from me. Um, no laziness on Halloween, thank you. Gentlemen, showing up in a dinner jacket and bow tie and pretending that you are James Bond, it will not do. Unless you show up with a pistol and PTSD, I do not. <laughs> I'd better find you later in the party, showering in your clothes with another equally traumatized woman. <laughs> or being very good at poker, something like that. If you're a lady, sexy cats. No respect. No respect for the sexy cats. In fact, I've got a plan this year to undermine them. I'm gonna come as a realistic cat. If only to give my girlfriend another chance to even have one. <laughs> I'm coming as a realistic cat. I've got the costume almost worked out. The final thing I need to figure out is a way to ensure that you can always see my anus. <laughs> Some sort of clamp. <laughs> like a splaying device, I suppose. <laughs> It's harder than you think, because cats don't have bum cheeks, do they? <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> they have a sort of panel <laughs> with a bum hole in the middle. <laughs> Hard to emulate that in a costume without help from Jim Henson's workshop. <laughs> that would have been a horrible villain in Scooby-Doo, wouldn't it? Someone dressed like that. Thank God you're here, mystery gang. There's a giant realistic cat haunting the theme park. Oh, and you think it's a man? No, we know it's a man. We want you to get rid of him. He's got his anus out. Fred and Daphne would be like, oh, yeah. this, the police should do this one. For once, the police can have one. This man is disturbed. What a dull show that was, Scooby-Doo. What an incredibly boring... As a child, I loved it, but looking back, it's the most boring show in the world. Every single episode of Scooby-Doo was about financial crime. <laughs> Low-level financial misdemeanor. Oh, no, but there was a guy dressed as Dracula. Yeah, but why was he dressed as Dracula? It was to scare away a board of investors. He was dressing as Dracula to devalue waterfront property. <laughs> That's fraud. That's a financial crime, isn't it? All I'm saying is, does that not strike you as a phenomenally dry genre of crime for a children's cartoon? Like, I can see why they need the ghost a bit. Just to spice things up, for God's sake. I mean... Hanna-Barbera must have had to have a meeting and gone, look, we've done a lot of test screenings and children refuse to engage with our cartoon about a van of traveling auditors. <laughs> they find it dull. I... We're gonna make one of the auditors a dog. The rest of them can be hippies. People, that's cool now, people like hippies. People always trust hippies with financial affairs. And the fraudster can be uh, Dracula. <laughs> Why would a fraudster be Dracula? I don't know, Stephen, I'm bringing solutions. <laughs> Try to save the show. 
Hippies are creepy now, aren't they, really? They were fun for a long time, but they're creepy now. <laughs> like clowns, you know, there's a limit, isn't there? Clowns have been creepy for a while, though. I wonder how long it took for them to become upsetting. Because <laughs> they must have been fun for a while, right? Had a honeymoon phase. There must have been a period where if you saw a clown, your first reaction sincerely would be to go, <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! It's one of the funnest men. It's one of the men who's only fun. Look, look, look. And then it would have for a while, what was that, 20 years, 30 years, they started to go, oh, they're quite odd people, actually. And then, <laughs> in their private lives, they're actually, they, they would have been shocking at the time. You would have said, hey, you see that guy who's a clown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, in his private life, he's quite sad and sort of troubled and odd. And it's quite serious, really, when he's not all done up or when he's off stage. He's actually quite troubled. You go, what? No. Not the clown. He's one of the funnest men. Now, these days, if I said to you, you see that clown over there? Well, in his private life, he's actually quite weird and troubled, and he takes this all very seriously. He'd be like, yeah, I know what a clown is. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's a clown. He's weird. That's happened with hippies for a while. Hippies were so oh, fun, and then Charles Manson, the ultimate creepy hippie. Charles Manson probably put the old nail in the coffin there. <laughs> for the hippies. And in hindsight, it seems naive, doesn't it? But there was a point where someone had to say, hey, you guys know that big social movement um, where much older, more charismatic uh, men, they take groups of uh, very young women who've often run away from home and dropped out of school, and they take them in a big group, and they take them far away from where they live with no uh, documentation or money or ID, and they have to go live in the wilderness, and they, he feeds them drugs. <laughs> well, there's been something untoward going on. <laughs> People would have been like, ah. <laughs> Charles Manson was the head of a fascist hippie death cult called the Manson Family, and he convinced his followers that if they all went out and conducted a series of high-profile, brutal slayings of Hollywood celebrities, that would trigger a race war that destroyed the Earth. And after that, the Manson Family would rule the world. He was not clear on the details. <laughs> he was an ideas man. The real blue sky thinker, Charles Manson. Um, and they all did that. They did exactly what he said, and he went to jail for his whole life, as well he should. And then, mid-trial, Charles Manson got a big old swastika tattooed right fucking there. <laughs> right in the middle of his face. Big swastika. Um, which, for me, at that point, is overkill. <laughs> it doesn't need that as well, does he? Once your fascist hippie death cult has brutally slain a bunch of A-list celebrities, in an attempt to bring about a race war that destroys the Earth, that, we get it, Charles. You're unreasonable. Over-egging it a little here. I don't know if any of you caught the best thing about Charles Manson's forehead swastika. Mid-trial. Not while he was still walking around, and not once he was in prison to fit in with the lads. <laughs> Mid-trial. Can you imagine being that lawyer? <laughs> it's the most high-profile case for 40 years, and everyone in Hollywood hates you, and you're his defense attorney. And he's in pre-trial detention. Now, Charles, we've had the uh, initial hearings. Um, I think, if we're lucky, you didn't do any of the murders yourself. So it's just your followers, so if we're lucky, we can convince everyone it's all just a big misunderstanding. Just try not to do or say anything that could turn a jury against you. <laughs> the next day, morning! <laughs> Fuck! You're killing me here, Charles. Day one of law school, lesson one. Try to make sure your client has as few swastikas on their face as possible. <laughs> We're aiming for nil. <laughs> it's difficult with that kind of stuff, isn't it? Because it's fun to, to hear about, but it's, it's true crime. So it's real, it's real people's lives that you're being amused by. But equally, I don't know what my options are because I've become disillusioned with fictional crime. <laughs> I used to love fictional crime, police procedurals, love them. But now we've all become a little more disillusioned with the police over the last two years, it's fair to say. 
And so when they go, this detective is a loose cannon who doesn't play by the rules. It's like, I'll fire another one. Oh, fuck. Can't one of them play by the rules? You can't have a whole ship of loose cannons. That sounds incredibly dangerous. It's a cannon. It shouldn't be loose ever, should it? Uh, rolling around, exploding on stuff. Uh, you gotta get to the point where you, the police procedure is gonna be, he's a detective who is aware of human rights. You go, wow. <laughs> wow. And it's set in America. Wow. <laughs> who knew it was even possible? And you get disillusioned with a lot of stuff about the, like, the whole idea of prison. I think like Charles Manson, Yorkshire Ripper, a certain level of person who's dangerous, they should be in jail, poke their brain for science until they die, fine. <laughs> But what I'm talking about here is the, what I call the little scrote category. <laughs> little scrotes, fights in nightclub, low-level weed dealing, phone-snatching little scrotes, right? I don't think putting them in prison particularly helps because if you say to them, hey, you're a little scrote, you keep fucking up. So what we're gonna do, is we're gonna lock you in a little room with a sex criminal <laughs> for like five years. Hopefully that'll calm you down. And when you pop out, you'll be productive and ambitious. <laughs> you'll have somehow picked up skills. We're not going to teach them. But hopefully in there you'll somehow... Like, what they've done is, the, the little scrotes, I mean, they've failed at being in society, haven't they? Society has a set of rules and expectations. They have failed to abide by those rules and meet those expectations. So they must be removed from society. That's our solution. But that's, it wouldn't work with maths, would it? <laughs> that system. Young man, you have failed at maths. And as a result, for the next five to eight years of your natural life, I sentence you to be banned from maths. <laughs> and at the end of that period, sir, you had better fucking be good at maths. <laughs> or I'll ban you again. <laughs> Until you learn. It's a good time to be a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> All this disillusionment. But like, it's always a good time, but it's been a real bumper harvest the last <laughs> few years, I think. And I, I wanna be one. I just, I, just need to, I just need to find one that for me, you know. <laughs> and I don't like JFK and whatever, all this like fucking starter pack, basic bitch, you know. <laughs> Who shot JFK is like the Ugg boots of conspiracy theories. I, love <laughs> I want a good one. One for me. And it's dangerous. If you read them for fun like I do, it's dangerous. Reading conspiracy theories for fun is like swimming with sharks. Yeah, it's a social pursuit, but one might get you. Eventually, people find one that they believe and they go nuts and they lose their goddamn minds. And that's happened to people I know. So it's a dangerous thing. You know, you have to keep an eye on yourself. The stuff you feed into your brain. I once met someone in terms of conspiracy theories. So they said to me, I used to not believe the moon landing happened, right? They, th they said, I used to think they faked the moon landing, which is pretty standard stuff. And I said, well, what changed? And they said, well, I found out. Now, the words found out are going to be carrying quite a lot of weight over the next few sentences. I found out that the moon landings did happen, and they must have, because that's where we met the aliens. So, here's the theory, broad brush strokes. The idea is we land on the moon, right? The Americans land on the moon. There's like a delegation of aliens waiting. They say, you made it. And they say, we've been watching you for a while and blah, 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 blah. And we're gonna try and give you all of our alien technology, right? To try and civilize you, bring you up to our level. Because we're, we're nice aliens. Um, we're benign aliens, whatever. And that's why, since the moon landings, roughly, technology has suddenly advanced so quickly compared to the rest of human history. Because all the modern technology, like back then, they already had iPhones, whatever's gonna come out next year. <laughs> they did, but they've been drip feeding it to us so we don't freak the hell out. Just like, shh, shh, the easy does, just, ooh, a slightly faster computer, ooh. Ooh, a phone with a camera, ooh. Easy does it, just. So that, you know, us apes don't panic. 
And it's a good theory. And I was like, right, so you believed a conspiracy theory, and the reason you stopped is because a bigger one came and ate it. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, basically. So I said, right. And they said, well, what you, what's your explanation? What's your explanation for how quickly technology has advanced since the space race began? And I went, well, I, and I had to get my phone out, and I've got it written here because I, I genuinely, it's so boring, I can't remember it. I showed her the Wikipedia page for Moore's Law, which is the observation that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles roughly every two years. Now, this guy Moore, he made that law and that prediction in 1965 when he was working for, I think, what would become, or maybe was already Intel. And um, it was already holding true by the mid-70s, and it still holds true now, roughly x equals y on a graph of uh, computing power. Um, plus, all the extra money devoted to the space race resulted in the development of lots of new technologies inherently, so that's another reason why. Hers is better, isn't it? It's better. Not one of you enjoyed a moment of that. I was telling you about the nice aliens, you... All your little faces lit up. Hers is better, that's why I'm envious. That's a better way to live. You could stride the earth like an intellectual colossus. You could be in here right now and look at you all and say, oh, oh, I'm ordering drinks on my iPhone. Thanks, Steve Jobs. Not Steve Jobs, it was the moon, people. <laughs> look at you naive idiots. It's much more fun to be her than me going, oh, there's a little... Yeah. Oh, there's a graph that actually... Yeah. So I need a conspiracy theory. There are lots out there, lots to choose from. Don't want the JFK one. The moon one is... Uh, I've already ruined it by looking up the real reason, so I can't do that one. Uh, Michael Jackson was innocent. That's a good one. That's still going. Like, people still tweet about that every day. Seriously, hashtag MJ is innocent on Twitter. Have a little look. It is a fucking insane corner of the internet. They're tweeting about it on Christmas Day. And I'm no better, because I'm checking on Christmas to see if they've tweeted about it. I'm not saying I'm better than them. I'm just amazed that on Christmas Day, Michael is not far from their thoughts. On Christmas Day, you could be saying, oh, thank you for coming all the way here. No, no, I'll turn to host. Sit, sit, sit. Yes, that's it, just over there. Actually, you know, you know what, Stephen, there is something you can do. Uh, just check on the roast potatoes. They're um, second shelf down. I just have to, one second. Uh, there we go. Those fucking kids are liars. They will burn in hell. Michael is in heaven, smiling down sand. Uh, ten more minutes, yeah. <laughs> we wish you, I mean, I mean... That's proper brain worms, isn't it? I mean, that's... That's insane. And the main reason it's insane is that they don't think Michael Jackson was a pedophile. You know, Michael Jackson. The pedophile. <laughs> like, even post-Jimmy Savile, they still have this faith, you know, like... I mean, Michael... Come on. Michael Jackson lived his entire life as an adult as if he'd been cursed by a witch <laughs> to have to tell all of us that he was a pedophile, but he wasn't allowed to use the word pedophile. <laughs> that is the only explanation for his behavior. He admitted all the weird behavior. He just never said the word. Even in the 90s, they'd say, Michael, do you befriend nine and 10 year old boys? And they come to stay with you alone without their mum and dad for three weeks, two weeks, and you give them booze and you sleep naked in the same bed. And it's not even your main bed. It's like a secret extra bed hidden in the attic of your mansion. And the corridor to that bedroom has got pressure pad alarms on it. And the door that enters that corridor is hidden behind a duke box with a secret lever that makes it slide across. That's right, the mansion with a theme park in the back. <laughs> which you built so that ever more children could constantly have a reason to come to your house. Is all of this true? And you can watch the interviews. Michael Jackson's like, yeah. <laughs> I think that's good. <laughs> Why would I think that? I must be a... Ooh. <laughs> Any adult man who behaves like that for multiple decades 
must be one of history's biggest... Hmm. <laughs> and these people are like, philanthropists. <laughs> cool guy, cool dancing skeleton guy. <laughs> A 30-year game of charades. <laughs> the highest possible stakes. My favorite conspiracy theory is the one where if you get the vaccine, Bill Gates takes over your brain with microchips. <laughs> I like that one a lot, because the people who are the most worried about that are the people who could really do with Bill Gates. <laughs> taking over their brain. <laughs> if only for a month or two. Just to sort out their affairs, you know, just get them on a better energy provider, I don't know. <laughs> Bill Gates is a very smart man. You should be so fucking lucky to have him. <laughs> Do you know how much it would cost to hire him as a lifestyle consultant? He started Microsoft. Think what he could do with your stupid brain, you know. You could just be trapped in there like a ghost, just, just every now and then I'd send a signal to Bill Gates saying, can I have some KFC now? While he starts a revolutionary tech company all around me, you know, sorts out my whole life. I'd love that. The American conspiracies all have the queen at the top, which is odd because they don't have the queen, but they're obsessed with the idea that she's secretly mega powerful. Whereas in the UK, we know that that seems ridiculous, so we don't bother putting her at the top of our conspiracies. Um, the queen's really hard to explain, by the way, to your relatives. That's my job in the family, is translator. <laughs> I'm more like a cultural guide, right? Because when my South African relatives visit at Christmas, they're like, we don't want to offend anyone, so we know of the queen, she's very famous, we've seen her on TV, whatever, but what do people think of her? Like, would it be bad for us to make a joke about the queen? Do people love her, hate her, ambivalent, what is it? And so I always say, well, she's, mm, she's sort of like everyone's Nana. <laughs> Not everyone gets on with Nana. But she's still your nana, and if people start to be rude about her, you'll suddenly discover you actually quite like your nana, and probably... Don't, so don't be rude about nana, you know, in the pub. Because they might be someone who really loves nana nearby. Also, her head is on all the money. She's a money nana. She's a money nana. That's the best I can do, money nana. And then they're coming over at Christmas, and then, of course, on Christmas Day, it's time to watch the Queen's speech, isn't it, in the afternoon? Because we're a family of immigrants. We are more British than any of you. So... <laughs> that's how it works. We actually watch it. Not like you traitorous little commoners. No, we, we go and we watch it. We stand up, and my cousins are like, is Christmas over? What are we... Why are we going to the living room? We go, oh, um... So what's going to happen now is, um... Money Nana... Um, <laughs> who is the unelected head of state. She's gonna take over our TV and speak to us through it directly in our living room. You know, like the Joker. <laughs> like something the Joker would do. Every Queen's speech should begin with, people of Gotham. <laughs> and they're like, what, she's, Money Nana just pops up out of nowhere. And it's like, no, she doesn't pop up out of nowhere. There's like an intro. There's like a little intro movie and we, we play her theme tune. Nominally, it's the nation's theme tune, but it's her theme tune, really. It's a go money, nana, go, or yeah, whatever. <laughs> Good luck, money, nana, just general, get big and strong, whatever it is. Just really good vibes, you know. And they're playing the theme tune, and then during the theme tune, there's a montage of military power. It's like artillery being set off in a park, and. Men with machine guns maneuver in perfect unison outside Money Nana's house. And the message is very clear. Don't fuck with Money Nana. She's got quite the squat. Then Money Nana appears on an enormous gold chair and she's wearing full military regalia or military medals and she's encrusted with the looted treasures of crushed tribes. <laughs> like a warlord or a, a Klingon. And at this point, my cousins are terrified because they're from Africa, right? If you say to an African, oh, um, the unelected head of state is gonna take over the TV on Christmas Day and after a display of military power, address you and your family directly in full military regalia surrounded by looted treasure. There's been a coup. 
Let's hope the UN establish a no-fly zone or... So they're terrified. My cousins are like, what does she say? Is it about hostages? And I go, no, she just kind of tells you how her year's been. <laughs> it's quite dull, actually. And it's weird, because we know how it's been, because we were there, you know. When she goes, oh, my grandson got married, it's like, well, I know. I got a day off, I know. There's never a surprise in the Queen's speech, is there? You're never like, what? what? Like, you're never... They don't, like, regenerate the new Doctor Who in the middle of it or something. They... And then she says, oh, you know, Merry Christmas, and she disappears, and you're free to carry on with your day. It's a chilling display of power, really. <laughs> Bone chilling. Right, so, it's the last five minutes of the show, and therefore, in accordance with the rules of comedy and the desires of not only this theatre, but Islington Council, uh, I am now going to have to go through the differences between men and women. So, um, <clears throat> now I know, I know, but we've got to get through it. So, okay, so, uh, do you guys know the phrase, it's always the quiet ones? <laughs> Good phrase, yeah, useful phrase. So let's say you have two colleagues, Alan and Susan, Susan and Alan. So, you have two colleagues, Susan and Alan. Let's say you go into work one day and someone says to you, did you hear about Susan? Oh, it's always the quiet ones. What that means is Susan's a bit sexy. Susan got off with someone at the Christmas party, Susan went home with someone at a nightclub when everyone went out afterwards. Someone found Susan on a swingers website. Susan's a bit of a dark horse, it turns out. Hey, did you hear about Susan? Oh, it's always the quiet ones. Alan. <laughs> you come into work and someone says, did you hear about Alan? Oh, it's always the quiet ones. Alan killed Susan. <laughs> there are helicopters above his garden. They're digging it up, it's bad. That's a fun difference. There you go. Ladies, your secret thing is sexy fun. Uh, chaps, ours is harrowing violence. So. I have been informed uh, by memes, uh, ladies, that none of your clothes have pockets. I don't know what you did to lose pocket privileges. Filling them with votes and contraception again, no doubt. No? All of your things will be in a sack. Like a hobo in a cartoon. Everything in a big, heavy sack. Will the sack be cheap? No. The sacks will be very expensive indeed. And cumbersome. Oh, um, something to clear up, actually. Um, this is a good thing to clear up now for, for comedy's sake. Where well, a lot of comedians say, uh, ladies, I don't know why it takes you so long to get ready. Uh, the reason is you have more things to do, so. <laughs> good, good to get that finally cleared up. <laughs> 10 things takes longer than one thing, so. There we go. Uh, I'm a man, I have one thing to do before I leave the house, make sure I'm not visibly covered in shit. And... <laughs> I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so, good to finally answer that question at last. Uh, toilets. <laughs> Specifically public toilets. Uh, very different attitudes there. Men will use any public toilet. They are willing to use a toilet in almost any state. They're willing to mop up a stranger's still hot piss if it means <laughs> that they can finally have a shit at a festival. So. <laughs> Men are fine with that. Women, I know women who have risked wetting themselves on a bus journey home to avoid using an even fairly good nick sort of public loo. <laughs> Amazing, and, and when you do have to use a public loo, it turns out that all of you split into either hoverers or nesters. <laughs> it's the hoverers I'm most impressed by because it's a, it's a wall sit with nothing behind you. It's the sort of thing Bruce Lee would do for training. I mean, it just... <laughs> Your entire lower body tensed, but still relaxed enough for piss to come out. How do you, how? 
I couldn't even hold it for that long. My knee hurts now, standing here now. <laughs> The other ones are nesters, and what you'll do is, in order to avoid touching the toilet seat with your bare ass, uh, you will take horrible, thin, translucent little squares of loo roll and lay them reverentially around the seat like you're making a horrible nest for an awful egg. Um, a lot more gender-neutral loos around, so I've come across a few nests lately. Like a filthy Bill Oddy. She can't be far. <laughs> Still warm. <laughs> and of course, makeup. Um, my partner was saying to me, you're very lucky, Pierre, that you don't have to wear makeup. Um, it is a financial expense. It is a time expense, which is fair. That's part of the getting ready thing, isn't it? Having to paint on your whole face again. <laughs> every day, <laughs> like a portrait artist. Um, Time expense, money expense, and it's a weight of societal expectation, a tyranny. You're very lucky to not have to cope with that. So I said, okay, stop doing it. Don't do it. Stop wearing makeup. Don't wear it ever again. And she said, well, no, I don't. Men want us to wear makeup. And I said, men don't know what they want. <laughs> they don't know. Do you remember how you all used to have to wear ruffs? You know, in the Tudor period. Well, it's not anymore, is it? There's no more roughs around. So what must have happened is women just went, Th these are horrible. And you all stopped wearing them. And men were annoyed for two days. For two days, men went, aw. Aw. And on the third day, they were just back to being, bleh, horrible, fucking. They'd already forgotten, just, bleh, just ape brain. They don't care. Men don't know. It's not about us. And she was like, well, you, you know, I, I, there's, there's, we're all wearing it, and you know, if you stop on your own, it doesn't mean everyone else will. So I was like, well, have a meeting. Have a lady meeting. <laughs> have a lady meeting at Lady Hall. <laughs> Unionize. You all get makeup wipes, and you go, OK, three, two, one. <laughs> OK, first person to break, we kill. <laughs> she was like, well, you can't just ban it here, because you know, it's a hundred, multi-million, billion-dollar industry. It disproportionately employs women. It's an art form. It's a form of self-expression. And I like wearing it. And I said, you like wearing it? She said, yeah. And I went, well, then what are we fucking... <laughs> Why are we talking about it then? <laughs> and the reason is twofold. There's that uh, uh, difference between men and women is that, well, is that men um, can't complain cathartically. Women are allowed to complain cathartically. She didn't want solutions from me. What she wanted was for me to go, oh. <laughs> Thumbs down from me for that. <laughs> Bad, actually. Um, whereas instead, I was offering solutions like some sort of idiot. Um, <laughs> Because you guys can complain cathartically, and it must feel very nice, because a woman can say to another woman, this intractable problem is shit, isn't it? And the other woman will say, it is shit, your opinions are valid, and you are not insane for having noticed or thought that. Ah. <sighs> if one of my male friends came to me and said, Pierre, I'm going to complain to you now about a problem that I already know has no solution. I'd say, what have I done to fuck you off that you would... Ruin my whole day like this. Get out of my house. Men don't get to do that. They don't have that catharsis. They just pack it all in there day after day until eventually they become one of the quiet ones. <laughs> That's the end of the show. Thank you very much for coming out, guys. Thank you.